Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus says in today's gospel lesson, Most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. This is his promise to you. Anyone who receives his word, who believes it, who applies it to themselves, who trusts in it, he says they shall never see death. And he says this elsewhere in the Gospels as well. He says in John 5, Most assuredly I say to you, He who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. And he told the crowd in John chapter 6 something similar. When he said, The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And even after that large, megachurch-sized crowd rejected his teaching, and leaves him, he turns to the disciples and asks them if they too want to go. And Lord, or excuse me, and Peter responds to the Lord for all of them, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus has come to bring life to those whose lot is death. This is everyone, then, in the line of Adam and Eve, born in the natural way. As St. Paul says, through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. And since all have sinned, and since the wages of sin is death, all die. Jesus says, in spite of all of this, against all of this, to those who are destined to die... If anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. He says anyone, so that no one is excluded, who are liable for death. Unless, of course, they exclude themselves. The Jews to whom Jesus is speaking in today's gospel lesson, they do just that. They don't keep Jesus' word. They don't receive it as true. They don't believe it. They most certainly don't place their trust in it. In fact, they do the exact opposite. They attack it. They attack him. They accuse him of being a Samaritan that is not a true blood, of, a true full-blooded descendant of Abraham. And they accuse him of having a demon, being motivated and provoked by an evil, lying, murderous spirit of the devil rather than the Holy Spirit. They lash out against Jesus with such vim and vitriol because they think they already have life. They're children of Abraham. They're disciples of Moses. They search the scriptures thinking that they have life in the fulfilling of the commandments which Moses gave to them, even though their obedience to those commandments is far from that which Moses actually required. Well, they believe in their own merits, that they're true merits, and they place their trust in themselves. They think that simply by being Abraham's descendants, by being Moses' disciples, that this is what makes them of God. This is what makes them alive. Imagining themselves to be of God by their blood, by their obedience, they can't hear Christ's word of promise for what it is. They can only hear it in the fleshly carnal sense. They can only twist it and mutilate it with devilish intent. Now we know you have a demon, they say. Abraham is dead, and the prophets... They are dead. And yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? But Jesus did not say that anyone who keeps his word would never taste death. That is physical death. He promises everlasting life. And in that everlasting life that begins now in this life by faith and extends into, ever, or extends into eternity. He tells Martha the same thing at the tomb of Lazarus, who has been dead for four days. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, Jesus never promised earthly health although he restored it to some during his ministry. He never promised a death-free entrance into eternal life like Enoch and Elijah were given in times past. No, all the saints, 
with those two ancient exceptions, enter life through death. Just as we must also, that is, unless Christ returns in glory first. And so these Jews mock Jesus, saying that if they keep his word, he will prevent them from ever physically dying. And to do so, he would have to be greater than Abraham the prophets who spoke God's word. And so they ask him, are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets who are dead? And of course they expect a negative answer. They expect him to humbly say no, because no one would claim to be greater than Abraham. He is the father of the nation. He is the one with whom God spoke. He is the one whom James calls a friend of God. No one would claim to be greater than the prophets, those with whom God himself spoke, those whom God showed himself in visions. No one would claim that sort of honor for themselves, they think. And Jesus will not honor himself. He says he'll let his Father in heaven do that. He will be glorified in his human flesh soon. So Jesus tells them, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. It's as if he were saying, your father Abraham, though he lived ages ago, saw my day. He saw the work that I would accomplish, and he saw it by faith because he believed God's word, and seeing it, he rejoiced. Your father Abraham, he did keep my word. Which is why Abraham and all of the patriarchs are still alive. They live to this very day, for all live to God. And God the Father said to Abraham, In you all nations of the earth shall be blessed. I am that promised blessing. And they still don't get it. Though they imagine that seeing, not seeing death means to not physically die. So they imagine that Abraham saw my day to mean that Jesus knew Abraham. Being children of the devil, again, they can only malign Jesus' words and hear what he's not saying. And so Jesus tells them bluntly, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Not I was, so that he simply predated Abraham. That's what the Jews must have thought when they said, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. No, he says, before Abraham was, I am. As in the burning bush. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Just as the one whom John sees in Revelation chapter 1, the glorified Christ, says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that there are those in our day who say that Jesus, or they claim that Jesus never said he was God. And yet, today, in this gospel, the Jews, who teach that, or who cannot hear Christ's teaching because they are not of God, hear him saying precisely that. They understood Jesus perfectly in that moment, claiming to be the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And that's why they pick up stones to throw at him. They have to show themselves to be true children of the devil. Jesus said in John 8, 44, just two verses before today's gospel lesson begins, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And as children of the devil, then they must demonstrate that same murderous intent, not hearing God's word, deceitfully, maliciously twisting it, and finally proving themselves to be sons of hell by picking up stones with which to murder the one who has come to bring life to all men, the one who is, in fact, himself the light and life of men. But Jesus eludes them. Using his divine power, John says, he hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Oh yes, the Jews will most certainly succeed in killing him. They will murder him. But not today. 
He will most certainly be a victim, but not because the Jews gain the upper hand, but because he, as the high priest of the New Testament, will offer himself as the sacrificial victim to God the Father, spotless and without blemish. He will most certainly be murdered by these men, but not in the temple built by human hands. He will enter into the most holy place of God's presence once for all, and by doing so, obtain an eternal redemption for all mankind. In order for Jesus to give life to anyone who keeps his word, he must first die. For he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance, as the author of Hebrews tells us in the epistle. And so by his death, he makes full satisfaction for all sins under the first covenant, all sins against God's law, and his suffering and death pay for every thought, word, and deed which is contrary to God's holy will. And it does so, his death does this, because it is the death of the eternal Son of God in human flesh. His blood, shed once for all on the altar of the cross, is the blood of the New Testament, which John says cleanses us from all sins, which the author of Hebrews says cleanses us, from, uh, cleanses our consciences from dead works. And so as often as we repent... And as often as we, in that repentance, flee to Christ for mercy, he once again applies that blood to us, forgiving our sins and renewing us to life once again. He dies in the flesh, so that we who must die in the flesh and but keep his word shall never see everlasting death. And this life he gives begins now, in this life by faith, and extends, as his life does, into eternity. Dear saints of God, he wants to give you these gifts once again. And every day, forgiveness of sins, new life lived here and now, and eternal salvation. And he gives it all through his word, through his promise. He says to you, most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. He wants you to keep his word. He wants you to hear it, to read it, to meditate upon it, to contemplate it, to apply it to yourself, for that is how it is truly kept. For by keeping his word, he keeps us in daily repentance. Repentance that acknowledges our sinful nature and acknowledges our sins, those times in which we have given into the sinful nature. Keeping his word moves us from repentance to faith that trusts Christ's promise to cleanse our conscience from all the dead works of sin and selfishness and instead enliven us and vivify us so that we may live new lives motivated and animated by the Holy Spirit, loving God and loving neighbor. Those who are not of God do not keep his word. And even in our day and to the very last day, there will be those who attack it, who attack Christ, and to do all they can to pick up stones against him. They remain in spiritual death now and into eternity unless they repent. But all who are of God, all who keep his word, to them Christ does not hide himself, but he reveals himself as the mediator of the New Testament who forgives sins, who gives life that we have now by faith and lasts for an eternity. If anyone keeps my word, he says, he shall never see death. Grant this word to us all. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Please rise, we sing together the offertory on page 22.